Welcome to Film at 50, a podcast that celebrates semi-centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe, and I'm very thrilled to welcome Harrison Blackman back to the podcast today to talk about Get Carter, starring Michael Caine, released 50 years ago in March of 1971. How are we doing, Harrison? Pretty good. How are you? Thanks so much for being back. You've had two really fantastic films to talk about on the early months of the you know 1971 podcast here. Uh, if you haven't listened to it already, check out our episode on THX 1138, which aired a few weeks ago. And now we're talking about Get Carter, which is another really famous film from early 71. Have you seen this before or heard about this film before? I'd heard of it, but I, I'd never seen it before last night. <laughs> did you did you know what yeah. you were getting into with this one? Because I sure didn't. I thought this was more of like a lighthearted James Bond kind of action film. It is not that at all. Did you were you prepared for what this movie was? Yeah, I, I really had no idea. I I was kind of I Michael Caine in this era like makes me think of like the Italian Job, mm -hmm. kind of that that period of his career. So I thought maybe it's more like. Uh, and from the description, it seemed like maybe, oh, he's trying to reconnect with his dead brother or something. And maybe it's yeah. more of like a drama. And it was not that. <laughs> so whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. sometimes that annoys me. And this one, I was pleasantly surprised. Like, oh, it's this kind of a movie. It's more serious, more gritty. Like he is playing this straight. It is like full bore revenge, uh, you know, crime movie. Really yeah. well done. Excited to talk to you about it. Uh, before we get into the movie, uh, like all, like what well, like our opinions about it, and you know our thoughts about the director and the performances, I'll start by giving our listeners, those of you who might not have seen this movie, here's a brief summary of Get Carter. So Michael Caine, the great Michael Caine, plays brutal and violent London mobster Jack Carter, who re who returns to his hometown in Newcastle after many years away to attend his brother Frank's funeral. The story goes that Frank died in a drunk driving accident, but Carter is convinced that his brother was murdered, and so he begins an investigation into Newcastle's criminal underworld. Soon, Jack comes across secret after secret, ultimately discovering something shocking that turns his investigation in a new direction, and his quest for brutal vengeance commences. <laughs> is that anything you want to add to that? I mean... There are so many characters in this movie. Yeah, I, I said, I it found, would take me 10 minutes to really synopsize this movie. <laughs> I found the plot very Byzantine. And I, you know, all these British names, they don't really register with me on the first watch. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I was like, oh, I, it's that guy again. And I guess that guy is related to this. And I, I went with the flow with this one. <laughs> yeah, there's only one other yeah. actor in the movie that I was familiar with. That was Britt Eklund, right. who was in The Man with the Golden Gun. <laughs> one, of the, one of the two Bond girls in the second Roger Moore Bond film. She's only in it for, what, one or two scenes? She's in it briefly at, towards the beginning. Otherwise, this is Michael Caine's show, and we have at least, what, 15 to 20 supporting actors throughout this movie that I did not recognize. So it was hard for me, I don't know about you, just to, like, put everyone together and like what, what's his motivation what's he doing why is he investigating him who's he going to next <laughs> I feel like this movie will be better on a second watch once I've kind of understood the plot a little a little bit more yeah <laughs> once you can tell apart the the different tousled brown hair of every character <laughs> so <laughs> there's that one guy with like the light kind of whitish blonde hair everyone else has the same dark brown hair <laughs> yeah everyone in newcastle looks the same it seems yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> so i don't know if you did any research on this movie there's a lot online i mean i didn't i'm not going to talk about all of it but i have a few interesting tidbits here to share with our listeners uh so this film was the feature film debut for writer director mike hodges he had only directed television before this so pretty solid uh, directorial debut for this guy. Yeah. Uh, he adapted Ted Lewis's 1970 novel, Jack's Return Home. I'm very happy they changed the title because Jack's Return Home sounds like, uh, you know, Oscar drama of some kind. <laughs> like, it does not sound... <laughs> I don't know what it sounds like, but it doesn't sound good. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound great. <laughs> so Hodges was determined to make the movie as gritty and realistic as possible. He would go on to direct a movie called Pulp, also starring Michael Caine, which came out in 72, 
So we'll see. I might get to that next year. He also directed The Terminal Man, The Flash Gordon movie, <laughs> and a couple films later in his career with Clive Owen. Uh, not, not a whole lot of really famous films that Hodges did after this. I would probably say Get Carter is his most famous film. Had you heard of any of those other movies? The Flash Gordon movie, I don't think I've seen it. It, was, it came out in 1980. <laughs> but okay just yeah, looking well, at the poster i was like oh this could be fun <laughs> the terminal man's a michael Crichton novel i think is it yeah maybe uh, maybe it's a different it's the same name <laughs> it could be um <laughs> yeah oh uh, yeah i'm not entirely sure but the, yeah there were a lot of michael Crichton adaptations in the 70s so if it's if not that one there's a few more i'll definitely get to soon so the director hodges he was surprised that someone of kane's stature wanted to play jack carter Kane said, one of the reasons I wanted to make that picture was my background. In English movies, gangsters were either stupid or funny. I wanted to show that they're neither. Director Hodges described Kane as a complete dream to work with. So that's kind of cool. That, that's kind of why Kane took this part on, is he wanted to show a gangster in a new light, which I would assume in 71 is absolutely true we didn't really see gangsters quite like this right yeah it's interesting that he's he was trying to maybe change his image a little bit and show a rougher side to what he could do uh, i mean the beginning of the movie it shows him reading a raymond chandler novel i noticed that too i took a note of that <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah so uh, that's clear like it's like i'm doing a noir mm -hmm. in in england and that seems to be part of the the signaling going on there and he does it all in this movie. He cries at one point. He walks out onto a street fully naked with a gun in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> this, if you like Michael Caine, <laughs> this is like, this is amazing. I mean, he is in what, every scene of this movie? I mean, we follow him all the way through. So as we'll get to talking about performances, if you're a Michael Caine fan and have not seen this one, which I had not seen it, uh, same as you, <laughs> this, was, this was a lot of fun. So a few more bits of trivia. So Britt Eklund, uh, who, as I said, would later appear as a Bond girl in The Man with the Golden Gun, she was, reluc she was reluctant to be in Get Carter, uh, being afraid of uh, being typecast and taking off her clothes. She was later happy she had been involved in the project. So it was one of those where she probably was like, oh, it's not a very big role. What is this movie? Who is this director? <laughs> And then 50 years on, I think she's like, oh, that, that was probably a good one to have on the resume. Yeah, I, I think, did I read that right that she was in The Wicker Man also? I believe, yes. I believe she's in The Wicker Man with Christopher Lee. Mm -hmm. And then she definitely takes off her clothes in that one. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. She does, doesn't she? I haven't seen that movie in probably 10 years. I think, I think you're right. I think she gets naked in that too. Does not get naked in the Bond film uh, because right. you're not, women are not allowed to be naked. <laughs> Not, not in, in, those, in those films yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah she is absolutely stunning in this I actually wanted her to be in more of this movie she's in it very briefly and get carter so get this the film was originally rated x which at that time was like the equivalent we have now of nc-17 uh for violence and nudity it was later recla reclassified as an r so that's kind of crazy to me. An X rating for this in, I guess, early 71, just you hadn't seen a lot of violence like this. The scene with Eklund, you know, is very steamy, the way it's cut together. <laughs> we also have a sex scene later where it's like cut, intercut with scenes of these two driving that was also, <laughs> I'm sure, pretty racy for its time. Yeah, so, it felt very edgy, mm -hmm. like 70s, kind of like, it reminded me of like Blow Up, the yeah. movie mm -hmm. where... It's like, oh, we're doing that now. We're actually going to show all this stuff. Yeah. Which would be totally unheard of 10 years before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even five years before. I mean, you, you yeah. got some of this kind of stuff in 60s foreign films. I don't think British cinema was doing this until like after the MPAA came out in, uh, you know, 68 with its rating system. Uh, that's what makes these early 70s films so exciting is that directors and screenwriters are doing things that they couldn't do even five years before. You know, I'm reading a, a, a biography on Mike Nichols right now by Mark Harris, where there's there's this chunk of uh, pages about, you know, when he made his first movie, Mike Nichols, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, like just having her say like, damn, and 
like shit and just a couple things in that film like it was it was hours and days of mindless inanity of trying to figure out how to get this past the ratings board so the movie could come out and three three years later you have midnight cowboy you have movies yeah. doing way more <laughs> than what who's afraid of virginia wolf was doing in 66 so there was a very fast evolution when it came to this kind of stuff definitely uh yeah because it got it got really violent this one <laughs> <laughs> very violent not to say you really see a whole lot of blood right i mean yeah probably the most shocking violent moment in get carter is when that guy's head goes through the glass on the car window and his face is all bloodied up i mean there's very little of actual blood in this i mean you get you see stabbings you see people getting shot but it's usually pretty tame by today's standards yeah i guess it's we don't expect i think i i didn't expect michael kane to be the one delivering such <laughs> violence uh so that's yeah. what felt unexpected yeah uh, it's been fun for me to go back and see some of these early kane movies like you know, when I was growing up, he was the guy in the cider house rules and Miss Congeniality. Yeah. <laughs> so to go back to late 60s, early 70s, films like Alfie and The Italian Job and now Get Carter, it's like, it's this is a different Michael Caine I did not have when I was a kid. <laughs> I, li I like to imagine that Alfred from Batman had this younger life doing all these crazy crime movies and yeah. then he grew up and became Batman's butler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Has Michael Caine ever confirmed that? <laughs> I don't know. His speech in the Dark Knight about the the jewel thieves of Burma seems to lend credence to his dark past. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they're related. Like I just saw this piece that Catherine O'Hara did where she said, I believe the character I play on Shit's Creek and the character I played in Beetlejuice are sisters. <laughs> sure. And I'm like, yeah, I buy that. <laughs> yeah. So maybe That's it's the same with Kane. Maybe uh, Alfred, uh, maybe it's his like, you know, brother. I mean, I mean, did he have any other siblings in Get Carter? He had the brother who dies. And then did he have other family, like other siblings? I don't know if the movie mentioned them. <laughs> if, if they did, I could not tell. <laughs> he doesn't seem like a, you know, a huge family guy. I mean, he gets upset when his brother, he believes is murdered. <laughs> he, uh, it doesn't seem like he's hanging out with his, family too much like before that happened um no all right so a few other things the film's only major nomination of any kind was a bafta award nomination for best supporting actor for ian hendry who plays eric who we see on the beach at the end that guy so he got a major oh. british academy award nomination for this movie but not michael kane not that guy the screenplay not like, even I'm like, the like, mob boss was a better actor than that guy. On the beach. That was that was kind of strange to me. I yeah. saw an IMDb. It said one BAFTA award nomination. I'm like, oh, did Michael Caine get a nom for this? That's cool. Came out in the early part of the year. You know, as I've talked about before, like films that come out in the first six months of the year, unless they're really great and they have, you have a lot of staying power, you don't see a lot of those at the next year's ceremony. So that that's the performance they singled out. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, I imagine it was very controversial at the time, right? In mm -hmm. terms of the violence. So maybe they would yeah. honor it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's so famous now, I guess when it, upon its release, it wasn't quite the critical success. I think we know of it today. Like I said to you, before we started recording, you look up any article online, the best British crime films, this movie is on every list, <laughs> you know? And a lot, it's a lot of the same titles too. It's like the same 15 titles on each list. You know, there's not a whole lot of them. This is definitely up there. Uh, let's see, the film in influenced Quentin Tarantino to be a filmmaker oh, among, sure. among, you know, I'm sure many other films. It was also one of Stanley Kubrick's favorite movies. Upon seeing it, he said, any actor who sees this will want to work with the director, Mike Hodges. <laughs> apparently that's what he's like where did he say that where someone was able to write that down and it's on imdb <laughs> yeah that sounds like one of those dubious imdb quotes <laughs> someone just someone just made that up <laughs> yeah I, there's, the sourcing's not there i'm not sure but i could believe that you know that kubrick liked this one i could believe that <laughs> well it definitely seems like an inspiration to guy ritchie mm -hmm. right 
And I wonder, I wonder when he shot A Clockwork Orange, which came out in December of 71. Because that film has a lot of like handheld, immediate, kind of gritty, realistic scenes. I mean, I wonder if he had seen this before he started shooting that, but it came out in December of the same year. He was, I don't think he was a filmmaker who was shooting just a few months before the movie came out. So that would be a surprise to me. Kind of interesting. Yeah. Let's see. The film was selected in 2004. This is Get Carter as the number one British movie of all time <laughs> by the all British time. of nice. all time, British, not crime movie, British movie of all time by the British magazine total film. <laughs> is that so that's 2004 like superior to any David Lean movie? Like it's that's just, crazy. it's the best yeah. one ever. So <laughs> you were, so if you had an issue uh, of total film in 04 and you, you were wanted to know what, what are the best British films of all time? Number one, 1971's Get Carter. I don't huh. think it's that good. <laughs> no, okay. it's not Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> it is definitely not. That's, uh. <laughs> I don't know who was picking these, but that's, that's yeah. a bit extreme. <laughs> and then finally, as I'm sure you are aware of, Harrison, the film had an American remake in 2000 starring <laughs> Sylv Sylvester Stallone as Carter. Have you seen the remake? <laughs> well, I mean, should I? <laughs> Do I dare? I mean, I, I kind of, that sounds really funny to think about of Sly Stallone trying Sly to Sly Stallone Vegas. as Jack Carter. Yeah, I'm Carter. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I'm almost 100% I saw the remake in a theater with a friend or two, and I have no recollection of it at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw it. Because, I mean, in 2000, that was my... So fall of 2000, I would have been a sophomore in high school. I was seeing everything. <laughs> like, every Friday, we go to the movies. And I think Stallone, I would have seen a new Stallone movie, especially a revenge action movie with Stallone. I was there. I don't remember it. The only thing I do remember, and I had to look it up just to be sure, Michael Caine is in the remake, too. Well, that's he, nice. He plays Cliff Brumby in the remake. <laughs> okay, well, that's a, that's a cool nod, I think, right? <laughs> and I have a memory of the fall 2000 fall movie preview issue of Entertainment Weekly where Michael Caine says about Stallone, he makes a nice Carter. <laughs> <laughs> he makes Why nice that Carter. sticks in my mind 21 years on, I don't know. But I, I'm pretty sure I remember seeing that. <laughs> that's a ringing endorsement. Yeah. <laughs> Kane, Kane was all on board. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, Rocky Rambo seems a little bit different than Michael Caine, right? Because yeah. Michael Caine <laughs> brings his like panache and his kind of high class sensibility to a working class role. Yeah. And Stallone's just a big action star. Yeah. So, and Caine is, Caine is yeah. very, yeah, Caine is very much in favor in the year 2000. That's the year he won his second Oscar for supporting actor. In the Cider House Rules, he won that, I believe, in March of 2000. So then yeah. in that fall, he follows it up with Get Carter Remake and Miss Congeniality with Sandra Bullock. <laughs> well, that's a great role, too. What a year. <laughs> I love I love Michael Caine and Miss Congeniality. He is so funny. In that. <laughs> he's yeah, he's telling her how to walk and like, yeah, yeah it's, it's very amusing. <laughs> if you haven't watched it yet, I did do a 20th anniversary episode on Miss Congeniality last December. You should check it out. It's a lot of fun. Sure. We'll do that. All right. So that's all of my trivia about Get Carter. Anything else you wanted to add before we get into it? Um, Anything else you read? I mean, on Wikipedia, it is long. I mean, there yeah. is so much about this movie. I was reading some of it and I just, it, it was just too much. If you want to know more about Get Carter, <laughs> go to the Wikipedia page. There's a lot. Well, I, I, one thing that I was really interested in was, uh, the the way the movie shot Newcastle and focused on its postmodern uh, mm -hmm. apartments and brutalist parking garages <laughs> and that seemed to be in line with the kind of a alienation of that time period that they were trying to depict. Mm -hmm. Maybe I mean I, think I, lo I love the nods at that. Yeah, I, I love the location work in this movie. It's like <laughs> like we go everywhere. We go to like I mean there's some like bigger locations, but then we also have a lot in like 
flats and different rooms and you really get the feel of like 1970 you know production design and the way things look I, I really loved the location work in this movie yeah yeah so what did we think of this film what what was your take on get carter neither of us had seen it before what do we think <laughs> yeah I, th I think it really anticipates uh a lot of revenge crime mm -hmm. movies there, there's all those guy Ritchie movies about british yep. people in like kind of northern england or whatever and mm -hmm. it's all like this and clearly this is setting that up do you think if, rich do you think richie had seen this movie oh like without a doubt <laughs> come on it's the top <laughs> crime movie right <laughs> every shot yeah. of this richie has studied <laughs> for sure and i'm trying to think about how tarantino you know thought of it i mean the, the violence is there and he just oh yeah more blood to it more mm -hmm. squibs yeah i'm sure he had seen this before reservoir dogs and pulp fiction like i bet he I mean, as I said in the in the notes, it said that this inspired him to become a filmmaker. You can definitely see some of this in his, especially his early works. Yeah, so it's an interesting precursor to all those and uh, the way it's riffing off apparently Philip Marlowe, I guess, based <laughs> on the, the, <laughs> the shot of Michael Caine on a, on a British train mm -hmm. eating lunch while reading a paperback of farewell my lovely and they keep showing him eating his lunch and i i, I don't know <laughs> like why why are we watching him eat his lunch so long i love that this character is a reader of novels you know i would not have expected this character to be a reader so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> or a or a crier <laughs> that's what gets you yeah so i really enjoyed this it took me like 45 minutes or so to really get into it because i was like oh as i said it's like it's not the movie i was expecting like it's much slower and there's a lot of characters i was very confused for the good good first half or so of the movie but once i kind of got into its rhythms i came to really enjoy it i really admired michael kane's performance in this i think he's doing something that at the time was really different it's like you didn't see a, quite the a performance like this one in a in a film of this genre and this style. I love the gritty nature of the movie. The documentary-like feel to a lot of the handheld was really great. And uh, yeah, I'm really, I was just really admiring of what Hodges brought to this genre and this material. For a first time director of a movie, I thought he did really, really great job. Yeah, like the, a lot of interesting stylistic touches. Like there's the scene where, uh, they're showing like the stick shift of the convertible and then intercutting that with the sex scene. That was great. I don't think I've weird. seen that in a movie before. <laughs> Have you seen that before? Like, yeah, I mean, he has like close ups of her hand and his eyes kind of looking at her. And it's not like it cuts from that to them having sex. It goes back and forth between them driving to the sex back and forth. And that was kind of unique. I hadn't really seen that before. Yeah, it, it was definitely like, ooh, let's do something weird. It's the 70s, <laughs> you know, uh, and yeah, I guess it reminded me of that very disturbing Cronenberg movie, Crash. Uh, I've, but, I've never seen that. I need to watch that. Uh, maybe you don't. Maybe you um, don't. <laughs> yeah, so, similar vibes. But there's that and like the scene, there's a scene where Michael Caine is walking up the stairs on one half of the screen and then the other half of the screen is, uh, I think Glenda is in the, the bathtub. Mm -hmm. and they're talking to each other but it's like a split screen scene even though it's not really a split screen scene like it looks two different beats but it's the screen is split and they're talking to each other yeah i watched the audio commentary a little bit on the dvd it had the commentary and michael kane was on there and the director was on there he actually the one of the parts i watched was that scene because it's such a pivotal scene in the movie and he talks about the only time that michael kane lost his shit <laughs> was during that shot that you just talked about because the focus puller messed up like at the very end and Michael Caine turned around and just went berserk. <laughs> and the director said, that's the only time in the entire production of this movie and the other film they worked on together <laughs> where Michael Caine was not happy and uh, you know showed it on set. I love that shot so much because it's right after he's crying and he's kind of discovered this pornographic film and the way you see the woman naked in the tub on the right side of the frame and him slowly coming up the steps and having that little monologue until he just runs in there and grabs her. I thought that was a really ambitious and unique shot. The way to do all that in one was really cool. I don't know. It seemed like the, like that hallway seemed really like 
tiny. I'm like, where did they put the camera to get that <laughs> shot? Maybe they were able to, you know, push, push back if it was like, there was some of it was a set or I don't know, but yeah. I really, yeah, I really it, like it that. It feels shot. like it has to be a set, right? But <laughs> I don't know how you would do it in, on location in that, that particular shot. Maybe it's a yeah. very wide hallway, like behind the camera. <laughs> <laughs> probably probably not i don't know like it, i this felt like a movie where we're mostly seeing real places like i didn't get the sense that we're in yeah, a lot of sets the, in this movie because the lighting was so dark most of the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's how you knew it was real i also love the brutality in the movie like this does not hold back in the second half right i mean he mm. brutally kills what at least three or four people like he stabs a guy and you see it in one shot like he's stabbing a guy blood is coming out just a little bit and you see the guy die in one take <laughs> like in one long shot and uh yeah. yeah he does Kane does not hold back in the brutality of this character yeah and that I think that gave me a little bit of pause as a viewer because I was like this feels a little disproportionate <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean in the beginning he's he seems not not a nice guy he does he doesn't really seem in the first 30, 40 minutes like someone who would be capable of what he does at the end. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> like, when he just picks up that guy and just throws him over the <laughs> over that balcony or whatever, and he's, the guy falls to his death and hits a car down below. I'm like, okay. <laughs> right. Well, well, the movie is also really funny at moments in the way it's shot. Like there's the scene where Michael Caine is talking on the phone, flirting with Britt Eklund. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that seems yeah, really funny. The in hotel a very odd way. owner <laughs> is listening in, and he knows that she's listening. Yeah, uh, and she, her rocking chair is rocking back faster and faster, you know. And <laughs> it's that's an interesting comedic moment. Uh, <laughs> that was a scene I will never forget. <laughs> yeah, it was not not nothing that I would expect. Right. I mean, it, any. I think any other filmmaker would have just have it be like the phone sex. You cut back and forth between Eklund and Kane, but to add in not only this other woman, the owner of the hotel or motel or whatever it was, like listening to his conversation. I believe she tells him at the beginning, right? She, he's like, "Can I call out?" And she's like, "It's going to cost you." And so she's right. she's not only listening to him; she's in a rocking chair, and there are at least two or three shots where he's in the background, out of focus, talking you know all the steamy stuff to Eklund over the phone and you're seeing the hotel owner rocking back and forth and the camera is in focus on her face as she goes back and forth that was very strange and yes did make me chuckle a bit because it was so odd <laughs> yeah it's like <laughs> and then he Ooh. takes her to bed right yeah <laughs> because that's where he's with her in bed when those two guys bust in and he grabs uh, Michael Caine, grabs the gun and walks out all the way to the street. <laughs> Naked while a, a uh, middle school marching band is walking down the street. That's right. Yeah. And that woman, she comes out of her house like next door and doesn't she break something? <laughs> yeah, she drops a potted plant or something and <laughs> <laughs> in shock. So, you know, tonal inconsistencies, perhaps comic relief, maybe. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of comic relief here and there. This is not a film where you're laughing all the way through. This is nothing like a James Bond film or anything like that, which was really, really popular at the time. And I mean, still is today, but, you know, really like the early 70s. Right. And I mean, this is, the year, no one -liners here, this is yeah. the year you get a new Sean Connery, James Bond and Diamonds Are Forever, which came out at the end of the year. So audiences were still going to those. This, yeah. I, I don't know why I thought that this was more of a movie like that. <laughs> You know, I just, maybe, maybe it's just because I had seen a couple other Michael Caine films of that era that are a little bit more lighthearted, like Alfie, Italian yeah. Job, which I feel is a little bit more tongue in cheek. This movie yeah, is much more yeah. serious. <laughs> a movie about Mini Coopers is not going to be very serious. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. What are some other scenes we liked in this? Anything else that kind of stood out to you? Um... I like the line when he called that guy's eyes, he said, your eyes are piss holes in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, that's unique. I mean, I, 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 I was, it was interesting, the scene where he finds the, the mob boss's country house and he 
smashes the head of a guard with a yeah. branch and then runs in and then bursts into their poker game, mm -hmm. sits around awkwardly for a few minutes <laughs> and then leaves. <laughs> so yeah, there there were I feel like that was it happened more than once where he there's like a long section of him like driving somewhere, he gets out, he beats up somebody, he goes into a place, and then they talk and then he leaves. <laughs> This was the segment earlier on where I'm like, I don't know about this, <laughs> about this movie. Like, I feel like, I feel like there were a couple moments in the first 45 minutes that could have been cut and not a whole lot would have changed. There's just so, like, my biggest issue with this movie is there are just so many supporting characters. There are so many characters who we meet only once and never again. And it happens like five or six times in a row where he's, it's a new scene with a new character. He's talking to them. How do I get there? Okay. Then he goes over to this place. Then he talks to that guy. And then he goes somewhere else. It happens a little too much. I was like, okay, the movie is about two hours long. I felt like there was some earlier stuff I felt could have been condensed a little bit. But other than that, that was kind of my, my one big issue with the movie was getting confused who was who and trying to figure out, like, why, do, why does he need to go through eight people <laughs> to get to, like, the heart of the story? It just felt like a little bit too much. I don't know. Yeah, I definitely felt that. It, it was too complicated in terms of how many how many shakedowns he had to do. And then I still wasn't sure like who was responsible and every single nature of every single circumstance of his brother's death. I mean, I got the vibe, but I wasn't like, oh, there was no oh moment. Mm. And that was my other thing that I had a little bit of an issue with. I don't I don't really know what the movie could have done to to help with this, but I, I wanted to know the brother a little bit more. The whole movie is about this brother dies. Right. They say it's a drunk driving accident. Kane, you know, Carter thinks it's, it was something else. Someone committed murder, but you don't really get to know the brother at all. I mean, I don't know if I needed five flashback scenes or something, but you don't care about the brother because you don't get to know him at all. So that was an element. I was like, God, you know, I wonder if the movie could have at least started with a scene even if it's like further back, like where he's interacting with the brother or yeah, something. Show sure why Just, he cares about him. Yeah, because it's why like you don't really get to know plan. their relationship at all. So, I mean, this movie just, it's off and running in the first scene. The brother is already dead in the opening scene. So we don't get anything with him except for like seeing his dead body. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> right, it's like in The Third Man, uh, Joseph Cotton is looking for Orson Welles in, in Vienna the whole time, mm -hmm. right? And at the end, Orson Welles appears. Yeah. And then, you know, they, turns out Orson Welles is bad. Big yeah. surprise. Uh, then, you know, maybe that, that would have been a twist if his brother was alive and oh, was yeah. actually a bad guy, you know? Yeah. If we hadn't seen his dead body at the beginning, I would have maybe thought that, like, oh, maybe he's not really dead or he's been kidnapped or something. You know, there was just, there was a little something lacking there, not really knowing or caring about the brother in question. We kind of brought the movie down for me a little bit. Whereas if we had gotten to know him in some way, even just for a scene or two towards the beginning, I, I understand that we couldn't really see the murder because then that would have given away everything that happens. You couldn't really show him dying. You needed that to stay a mystery. But I felt like the movie could have developed the brother. Or like, a yeah, bit. if Michael Caine had one speech or explain like something that his brother did. Yeah, some act of some, kindness or something. something. Right. Yeah, it's just like, oh, he's my brother. So therefore... <laughs> we have a movie we have a plot <laughs> you know? which i feel like it's kind of the easy thing to do as a as a novelist as a screenwriter it's like you kill off a family member you have a movie <laughs> you know revenge <laughs> like and sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't i mean i feel for the most part it worked pretty well here yeah uh i would say the last 30 minutes was like my favorite part of the movie that's when things really get going you know, we get a shootout at like a train station. There's this great shot where he, he, he shoots and kills like the guy with the with the white hair and the camera does like a three part cut like to up to uh, Michael Caine's face, just standing there with the gun. <laughs> like that was great. I thought that was really fantastic. Um, yeah. And then, uh, as I said, I love how he just picks that guy up and throws him. <laughs> <laughs> the car. Yeah, that was pretty brutal which and, on uh, the commentary i watched the commentary the director was like yeah we wanted to do it in a way you'd never seen before in, in any movie you the guy would hit the ground we wanted him to, we wanted to drop him on a car where inside the car there was a, a mother and her children <laughs> to make it really like 
you know, scary and like, oh gosh, if he had just fallen a little bit more this way, he could have actually hurt or killed this family. I, I, that didn't come through for me that much. Like, you, did you get like a close up of the family in the car? You just, I, saw, I, I, I could see there, no, there were people in the car. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, don't, they didn't cut to them before they hit or something. And, but they, yeah, they show them uh, like people helping those two women out of the car. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that was realized to their <laughs> intent. <laughs> but yeah, there's such, there's great moments of, you know, Michael Caine, you know, you know running, panicked, of you know holding the holding his gun and like walking like to <laughs> to his destination towards the end i thought the the final major sequence was pretty effective of him running across the beach and you know what ultimately happens there i don't know should we give away the final reveal uh harrison because that was a big surprise to me i'm like oh that's not that's why there's not uh, a series of get carter films <laughs> Because I'm watching this, I'm like, I want, you know, this is, he's so great in this role. I'm kind of surprised that this didn't turn into a Dirty Harry franchise or something. And then I went, uh, oh, okay. (laughs) I mean, I thought it it made logical sense that he had kicked the hornet's nest too far. Yeah. And so he's gone kind of psychologically insane by the, by the end. Like what he does to Eric, once he catches up to him which was my only other flaw in the movie was that Eric was not a very good runner, right? If you're right. running for your life, Harrison, this really, this gangster guy is on your tail right behind you with the gun. Wouldn't you run faster? <laughs> yeah, well, not everyone can run like Tom Cruise and that other guy in the firm. Uh, <laughs> if Tom Cruise had played Eric. <laughs> then we'd have a real foot race. He would yeah. have been, you know, I mean, it's a little bit like the horror film where the... <laughs> where the villain is walking and the, in the, you know, the heroine is running and they just, she just can't get <laughs> far enough <laughs> away. But I mean, he's like, he's like struggling. Eric is struggling. Like, oh, oh, I'm getting so tired. I'm like, your life is on the line. <laughs> These what people go to the pub too much, dude. <laughs> They're just always going to the pub. They, They're not, he yeah. is not trained for this moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, at the end, like Carter is, First, making him drink <laughs> all this booze, and then he doesn't kill him by shooting him. He just <laughs> he hits, hits him. him. <laughs> and then he watches him like be carried over to the sea, over to the water, with this drops- strange <laughs> mining device that I don't understand. Uh, this, this kind of mine cart in, in the sky. Yeah. Yeah. And then let's talk about the very final moment. And if you want to skip ahead a few minutes, go ahead. But we need to talk about how this ends. So Eric dies, and then Carter is walking along the beach and he's about to throw his gun into the water. And yeah, some like myster- and some mysterious figure from afar shoots him in the head, dead, and he falls and he's and he's and he's gone. And the last shot of the movie, it ended for me very much like a, like a Bonnie and Clyde, right? Like, yeah. like, like where you're, you're on board the protagonist or protagonist, even though they're doing rotten things, like you're kind of with them all the way through. And then, so Carter is killed. We get one final shot of him. You, it almost feels like his body's going to be carried out into the water. And then it just goes to credits and that's it. <laughs> Do yeah. we know who shoots him? It's just like this mysterious figure. Well, they, they they showed before that the the mob boss calling this assassin, right? Oh, That's the gotcha. only scene without Michael Caine, and he's like, you know, do the job. He's like, okay, and then. But so we don't get to know off. who that is, right? We we're not we don't really meet him in the movie. Oh, we don't need another one. We don't need <laughs> another person in the movie. <laughs> Seven more characters. But yeah, it sure. felt right. I was like, okay, so that's why there's not a dirty Harry like franchise. <laughs> It yeah, I mean he takes it to the extreme in the final half hour where to for him just walking off, especially since we don't know the brother. I think if we had gotten to know the brother, maybe it could have ended with uh Carter being alive at the end. But I felt like the way that this movie, the trajectory of the last half hour, it made sense for me that he would have to die too. <laughs> well, I think after he murders I think it was the the character named Glenda, the woman. One of the 15 uh, characters. <laughs> yeah, well, and he, he injects this woman with like a lethal dose of something yeah. and leaves her half-naked body in a lake. 
like I was like, okay, this guy's irredeemable, you know, like this is really bad. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I always kind of was on his side and, and I mean, I understood where he's coming from, but it's, it's, it gets trickier in the last half hour. He does some pretty vile things and you're like, I don't know. Am I supposed to root for this guy at this point? It's, it gets a little bit, you know, kind of, kind of in that gray area. <laughs> oh, it's more, it's, it's deep gray. It's, <laughs> yeah. It is Vonta black. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I thought the ending worked really well. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, apart from those three things I mentioned, I was pretty on board with this movie. Anything that you want to talk about the director or the performances that we haven't touched on? I mean, as I said, I thought Hodges did a really great job with this. I, I think there could have been a tendency to go more tongue in cheek, more comic relief. And he stayed away from that. I feel like for his very first movie, he kind of been like, well, what's popular about now? Let's make this more of a bond. Maybe that'll, that'll be a good thing. But I think he made the right choice. And I love that Kane is not just a cyborg. You know, he has emotional moments. Uh, he, has mom he has moments where he's winking at the camera like a little bit. But for the most part, he plays it straight. And I thought he was just fantastic in this. If you're a Michael Caine fan, this is a must-see. <laughs> he's a lot of fun to watch in this one. Yeah, without him, like, if yeah. an actor with lesser abilities, this wouldn't, movie wouldn't work at yeah. all. Because you have I to still root for him, despite how horrible <laughs> things he's doing, right? You still have to be like, uh, okay, it's it's Michael Caine. Yeah. You know? but, and, and he's just, he's yeah. so charismatic. He's so handsome. You believe that all of these women would just go for him. <laughs> like, admit, that makes sense. But yeah, I don't know of how many actors who could have pulled this off. Uh, Hodges, as I said, was kind of surprised that someone of Kane's stature would do this role. And I almost wonder if Hodges had gone with an unknown or someone who's not, who didn't have a lot of credits behind him. I don't know if he could have pulled this off the way that Kane does. Because I think that this movie lives or dies by the performance, you know, whoever plays Carter. And I thought, I think Kane makes this work as well as it does. Yeah, and that may explain the, the result of the Stallone one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think there is room for a remake of this with a better actor. Sorry, Stallone. <laughs> you know, especially well, done is, in Britain. Yeah, I mean, he, he's had good performances, but... Yeah, he's great in Creed. He's, he's, he's done some good work, Stallone, by far. But, but, but he's not the right type for this role. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So, and it's hard to talk about the other performances because <laughs> I don't know. Just, I don't know who any of the people are. I got confused often who was who and what the characters' names were. So, I'll just say that for the most part, I thought the, the ensemble of actors in this were really strong. Like for what they had to do, they felt believable. I was never pulled out of the movie at any point by a performance I thought was lacking. You know, they do what they have to do. Uh, I don't know if uh, the guy who played Eric <laughs> was deserving of a BAFTA award nomination. That's kind of odd to me. I would like oh, to know the it. I would like yeah. to know the conversation around that nomination. <laughs> like, like them in are like, okay, what about this guy? <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, I mean, did they have ten nominees? I mean, I'm assuming it was five <laughs> nominees of every supporting actor in a film in all of '71. Interesting, because <laughs> he, I mean, he's fine. I don't know what he did that was really stellar. <laughs> right. Well, he, he didn't ever have a big, interesting scene. So yeah, maybe a, it was maybe it was the, the believability yeah. that he was a slow runner. Maybe that's what did it. <laughs> uh -huh. Maybe that was it. Mm -hmm. All right. So my last question about Git Carter Harrison, which I bring up each time. This one's a little tricky because there is a remake that was made 30 years or about 30 years later. But if they were to remake this now, let's say in Britain by a really great kind of British director wanted to remake get carter in the 2020s like how would it be different how would it be similar what do you think would have to change um yeah they'd, they'd have to make him more likable mm -hmm. in order to justify the amount of violence yeah for mm -hmm. sure yeah i think the brother would come in more i think we'd get to know him i think that would be almost too obvious i i wish i you know i should have maybe looked at some clips I, I wonder in the in the remake from 2000 if they had more of the brother or if he was just off screen almost the whole time like he is in the original but i feel like we'd get to know him a little bit more so we'd be more rooting for carter in a remake maybe yeah. today uh and i think the actor they should you know they should just have michael kane do it again <laughs> <laughs> well i think i think yeah uh you know more diversity would be more diversity for and then maybe 
uh, women characters. Yeah, who are they're not really all yeah, stereotypes. The women you know? in this film are very like you know overly sexualized, like objects in this movie. You don't really get yeah. to know them very well. I'd say the the hotel owner is the one who's most developed. Like we get to know her more, yeah, but it's still you know barely anything there. <laughs> so like yeah, I think you'd have to do a lot to rejigger it to make it. Um, resonate with 2021 yeah but i you know i i wouldn't be surprised maybe if not the next five to ten years but at some point i feel like the the name get carter is known well enough so many projects are getting remade and they're doing you know different versions i i I would get the sense it's been 21 years since the stallone movie which did not go over well but i feel like enough time has passed i could see someone maybe taking this on even making it like a limited series you know, even like a four-parter or something, like some of these I've seen on Netflix. I feel yeah, like there's you, something there. You could put Idris Elba or Charlize Theron as Carter. And Carter would, could be a woman. Yeah. I would change it up, you know. Or a person of color. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You can make Carter gay. Go for it. Yeah. And there's so many options. Yeah. So I mean, maybe it'll happen at some point. But yeah, I do think uh, you're exactly right. There'd have to be, <laughs> there'd have to be a really likable actor there especially when they're, you know, really being brutal to these characters in the second half, you would need to be on their side. And, and we are with Kane. Like I, you know, that, he's a, yeah. just a likable guy. I mean, when you look at Kane, you know, I, I wonder what it was like for audiences in 71. You come to a movie like this with so much knowledge of who he is as an actor. I mean, I've probably seen Michael Kane in 30 films, maybe more. <laughs> like I, you, we know him so well. And, you know, obviously much younger, a different kind of character for him than we're used to. But yeah, yeah I think if you were to make it now, you, you'd need a similarly likable actor. And I, I'm sure Kane would come back, do another cameo in that remake. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's collecting paychecks all the time. There's a film, I have not seen it, Harrison. It came out in 2009. It's called Harry Brown. And it, I believe it's a British crime film. And it's an older Michael Kane on the cover with a giant gun. Similar to how he looks in, like, towards the end of... Uh, get carter and I, I i'd be curious to watch that and see like how similar it is to get carter because it looks from at least yeah. from the box it looks kind of like similar in tone and if that's character. his his unforgiven <laughs> right yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> someone should just make a sequel to get carter where oh he didn't really die <laughs> i'm so long <laughs> he, he, they, they, they cut to like they do in uh what is it austin powers and gold member where they cut to a younger michael K- <laughs> they cut to a young like they, they, they have that technology now right where they just like they have a younger michael kane face and he's like oh it missed <laughs> or not we, i mean we see his forehead with the but maybe maybe just nicked him maybe it didn't actually go through <laughs> uh yeah i mean that was a pretty de- definitive kill shot yeah uh, i think when you're shot in the head i think when you're shot in the head they might have talked about a sequel after the success of, of get carter and then they were like, to be a prequel uh, prequel yeah. yeah, it's like when Titanic makes a billion dollars, they're like, can we do a sequel? <laughs> can we come up with something? <laughs> Just, it's not going to happen. No. Yeah, so yeah, I would give this, I mean, uh, either a very strong three out of four or a soft three and a half out of four. Like, it's definitely out of, uh, how many films have I watched for the podcast for 71? I mean, at least 10 to 15. This is definitely, I would put in the top three or four. Like, this is this is at the top of the quality films I've looked at for the podcast for the, over the last two, three months for 1971 releases. I, I had some issues with it, especially in the first 45 minutes, just trying to follow it. But yeah, I would, I'd say this is a very strong film worthy of its place on these lists of, of the, you know, the best British crime movies. Definitely worth a look if you haven't seen it. Yeah. Yeah. I give it three out of four for sure. Cool. All right, so that takes us to our final two segments. The first one is the, the Divine Double Feature. That's where we pick a more modern film that would make a good double feature with 1971's Get Carter. Did you pick the remake? <laughs> no, no, no. I, okay. I picked uh, uh, Layer Cake. Okay, yeah, that um, was on my runners-up. Layer Cake with Daniel Craig. I yeah. believe that's the film that catapulted him into being Bond. I think that's the movie that all the yeah. Bond producers saw, and they said, okay, this... This might be the guy. Yeah, because in that one, Craig plays, he, he's like a drug dealer and he's trying to get out of the business uh, and he kills a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> and the ending is very similar to this one in terms of uh, the, <laughs> the main character's fate. So 
I think it's an interesting. You you both have two blonde male leads mm-hmm. in a British crime movie, and it feels it does feel like a spiritual successor to um, Get Carter in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, that's a great choice. I, I saw that in the theater. I really enjoyed uh, Layer Cake. A lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, I went with uh, I went with a, a crime film from the late '90s. It was the breakthrough for Clive Owen. And I did not know this till looking up his filmography. It's also directed by Hodges, who made Get Carter. And that's Croupier from 1998. It's kind of like an indie film made, made overseas. It, I think it slowly kind of started coming out in the United States over many, many months. But uh, also a crime film, really powerful lead performance by Owen. It was his breakthrough. He's fantastic in it. Um, you know, a lot of great location work like Get Carter. And you can kind of see the evolution of the director over about 27 years. You could see his first film made in 71 or came out in 71 and then see a film he made towards the end of his career. It was the second to last film he made, which came out in 1998. So you can kind of also see the evolution of him as a director too. So I'd recommend that. I also would recommend In Bruges. Have you seen that with Colin Farrell? <laughs> yeah, I, that, that came to mind as well. Yeah. If you wanted something a little bit, a little bit newer, a little bit more action and a little bit and more fun <laughs> so it, it after get carter yeah <laughs> it's fun it's funnier if you wanted something a little bit funnier directly following get carter which is more serious yeah but it's in, still bleak. in bruges yeah, yeah it's bleak there's some brutal deaths in it but uh, colin farrell's great in it and brandon uh, uh brendan gleason <laughs> really great pair in that so i'd also recommend in bruges too yeah all right our final segment is beyond the flick that's where we take an actor or a director from the movie talk about their career this is the an obvious choice michael kane so as we as we talked about before we started recording this was tricky for me because i mean there's probably 20 to 25 movies <laughs> of michael kane's that i like or love and i was like well how do i pick my three favorites so what i did harrison was i picked three films where he's the lead he's the star because it's easy to say, oh, his best film is The Dark Knight, but he's only in a little bit of that movie. So it's a little bit tricky to call that his best movie when he's only in a few scenes. Uh, what did you go with with your, uh, your top three choices for Michael Caine movies? Well, I wanted to... S- I haven't seen all of Michael Caine's early stuff, but I, th- I thought the Italian job, the original... Yep, that's in my top a, three. ...is, is a mm-hmm. good example of that period of his career, and it's mm-hmm. very iconic, and Yep. Of course, the Mark Wahlberg movie overshadows it a little bit now in terms of the popular imagination, but the Mini <laughs> Coopers are the star of the movie, I think. Um, was, was Kane in the remake? I don't think he was. No. So he, so he agreed to be in the Get Carter remake, but he's not in the remake of the Italian show. <laughs> they went with well, Donald Sutherland instead. Both, both of those movies have very little in resemblance to each other besides the cars, <laughs> right? So <Yeah. laughs> uh, I, I think they just like the name and the cars. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, and I, I think for another dark Michael Caine movie, you could go with Dress to Kill. Yes, um, which, which is a very is, problematic movie. Yeah, I, I agree, which, and I don't that think I also well in my that I also yeah. like a lot. I was it was I was flirting with that as my third favorite, mm-hmm. but I watched it again in December. It was on the Criterion Channel. I hadn't seen it since I was probably in high school or early college, and I'm I was I for, I totally forgot how it ended. I was like, oh right. Ooh, that doesn't really. <laughs> that, yeah. that that's very problematic today. It, the way it, it ends today, it, it it reads as a very transphobic film. Transphobic, yeah. Um, but the elements of the movie that are like Hitchcockian homages mm-hmm. in De Palma's earlier career, yeah, those are really interesting. And Michael Caine is very sinister in it, so mm-hmm. it is a. It's a it's great a compa- Caine performance. It's a companion piece to this one, I think, in in that <laughs> sense. But yeah, I mean, I would take. De Palma's other Hitchcock movies, Hitchcock-esque movies like Sisters mm-hmm. or uh, Obsession over Dress to Kill. Really? Obsession, yeah. I have to watch again. That one I, I saw only once. It did not do a whole lot for me. My favorite De Palma movie will always be Carrie, from, also from 76, which I just think is a, just a fantastic adaptation of King's book. But Sisters is really interesting. I just discovered on Screen Factory, uh, the Blu-ray, I discovered The Phantom of the Paradise, I believe it's called, from 74 which is not a Hitchcockian movie. It's like, it's a whole other kind of genre film, but really fun. Yeah, Dress to Kill is so much great style. The sequence of Angie Dickinson yeah, at the in museum. The, in the Met, yeah. 
from that moment to her death is so great. <laughs> like, it's probably, it might, might be the best Brian De Palma sequence, at least of his early career. It's so, there's so much tension and so erotic and surprising and shocking. It's just like, it's really great. But then, but you have to deal with the ending, and it's just like, mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot oh, okay. of those are like that. It's like there's this amazing stylistic sequence in Body Double, mm -hmm. um, where they they play the relax song at, in during the filming of a porn movie, and that scene is just so much more mm -hmm. interesting than the rest of that movie. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a, you know, take it in small doses. Mm -hmm. I for the the third part of the the Michael Caine aspect i would just say any of the christopher nolan movies okay you just put, a, did you just put that role. as num number one chris <laughs> nolan <laughs> yeah because i think um i think that's how most people know michael Caine now at least young people uh and so his first his first film with nolan was i believe batman begins in 2005 that has and then be, he yeah. has appeared in every single one even i looked up i guess he has a voice over in dunkirk <laughs> right because I, I don't remember him from dunkirk but yeah um yeah he's in every one he's even in Tenet for like a minute um <laughs> which just makes his he's presence. like that actor who's in every pixar movie what's the Rat ratzenberger or what's his name? <laughs> like it's it's a uh, christopher nolan's good luck charm to have Kane. I remember seeing Tenet and I didn't know much about Tenet or if Kane was in it. And I'm like, Kane's going to be in this at some point, right? Yep, there he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I would. What would you say is Kane's best performance? No. The Dark Knight in, in a Nolan film? No. Yeah, I think his speech in The Dark Knight when he says, Some men want to watch the world burn. You know, yeah, that's right. Like that, that speech is pretty iconic and that's probably his best seen in those movies like I, I didn't really care for his part in interstellar or mm. kane, know, kane is pretty heartbreaking at the end of dark knight rises where he breaks down weeping did, did you did you think that was over the top i always like that part yeah well at the but, end but, they, but they all but, go to a cafe but, but, in italy and it's not really a it does <laughs> yeah it's done away yeah. with uh at the very end when we're oh he's not dead and so yeah it kind of like, does but 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 just <laughs> You don't see him weeping like that on camera very much. So I just thought that was kind of powerful. Well, yeah, that, that movie needed some emotion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one, of my first, one of my yeah. first episodes of the podcast was a look at Christopher Nolan's career uh, after my friend Brandon and I looked, looked at Tenet. And yeah, we had some things to say about The Dark Knight Rises, <laughs> which was kind of disappointing, which it was hard for it not to be. Like, how do you follow up The Dark Knight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean bane bane is 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 funny to talk about so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i've got lots of runners up i've got alfie from 66 that probably was the film that made him a star was 66 alfie which would, would also be remade in 2004 with jude law i don't think kane is in that ring <laughs> uh let's see i also put dress to kill one of my favorite uh woody allen films uh the name of someone <laughs> that that you we know, don't want to talk about that, that we just don't want to talk about anymore but hannah and her sisters is such a great film and that film won michael kane his first academy award he is phenomenal in that movie it's a kind of a unique performance i think in his long filmography uh dirty rotten scoundrels with steve martin have you seen that <laughs> no <laughs> really funny late 80s comedy with steve martin uh, the Cider House Rules, not a film I really love, but it got him his second Oscar. He is great in The Cider House Rules. Anytime he's in the movie, it works really well. Some of the other parts of it, not so much. Uh, Miss Congeniality, one of my favorite Sandra Bullock movies. He's a lot of fun in that. Uh, the Quiet American from 2002, where he got an Oscar nomination for Best Lead Actor. A really outstanding drama, uh, also starring Brendan Fraser. Uh, you know, not a film that's really talked about anymore, but I saw it in theaters when it came out after he got his Oscar nomination. It's a great uh, Michael Caine performance. I think it's worth looking looking at. And yeah. Outside, outside, have you have you heard of that film or seen that film? No, I'm a huge fan of the book. Oh yeah, you I should had check no it idea out. that the movie existed. Yeah. Yeah, check out The Quiet American. Came out in 2002. And then outside of uh, Chris Nolan movies, after that, uh, I really like him in Children of Men from 2006. Have you seen oh, Children he, of Men? Remember he's, he's in, in that. that. He's got Is like he? a long hair. Oh, Cl yeah. Clive Owen. Like he goes, to, he goes to that, that like 
what, what, I, it's not it's not like just a house right it's like well it's it, like a he's compound like, he's growing marijuana yeah like right that's uh-huh. his compound and he's <laughs> growing a lot of weed i can't remember how much of that movie he's in was it just that scene i think it's just right. that scene where they go to that place and then right after we have that you know terrifying scene in the car where the camera spins and julianne moore gets shot and killed i think that's yeah. right after the the uh, michael kane scene He's also in the uh, Kingsman, the Secret Service from 2015. I don't know if he was in the sequel. Oh, he's uh, a, he's the head guy, right? Yeah, because uh, Colin Firth is the more mm-hmm. of the main character or the yeah. main mentor. Yeah. So f- a few films I still need to see, like Harry Brown, which I mentioned, which came out in 09. I don't know if that came out theatrically, but the the poster, the DVD cover, I'm kind of intrigued to see that one. Uh, I've never seen Educating Rita, which came out in '83, a drama that also got him an Oscar nomination. I believe it's a, like a drama, like about music or something. I, I'd like to check that out. I don't know. It sounds like a Pygmalion thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one, I can't wait to get to it next year, 1972. He's in a movie called Sleuth. Have you heard of Sleuth? It's like, a, I think it's a murder mystery. I think it's just a very small cast of just a few characters, but he got an Oscar nomination for that. His first, I believe, nomination for Sleuth, which came out in 72 which is a movie that also got remade in the late 2000s. And Michael Caine played, I believe, the other character, the other lead character in the remake in like 2007, 2008, somewhere around there. So he is not against remakes. <laughs> yeah, if, if he gets to be in them. If he gets to be. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of interesting. So he makes a film in 72. He plays one of the two main guys. And then in like 2007, 2008, they do a remake and he plays the other guy. That's something you don't see very often. I thought that was kind of a kind of yeah. a cool touch for a remake. I think he, he and his agents know how to stay relevant. They've, he's maintained relevance throughout. Maybe he, maybe he was trying to get Oscar nominated for playing the other part. That would have been a way to do it. <laughs> then he could probably be the first person in history to be nominated for both lead roles. <laughs> at different years (laughs) didn't happen oh well uh so my third favorite michael caine movie harrison is the man who would be king with sean connery have you seen that or heard of that no 75 it's it's like this it's you know speaking of kind of gritty and serious like it's it's this really weird i believe john houston directed it and i did a year of sean connery two years ago and I saw it for my second time. The only time in my life I got to see Sean Connery in person was, I believe it was 2010 at the Arclight in downtown in, in Los Angeles. And he was there to present The Man Who Would Be King, a movie I'd never heard of before, was not a, really that interested in. But I felt like, well, if I'm ever going to see Sean Connery in person, this would be it. This is probably the only opportunity. And it was because he passed away last year. And uh, really just kind of a a movie that draws you in, really unusual story, great pairing of Connery and Kane. I don't know if they did a second film together. They might have, I'm not sure, but they're they're great together. That would be my third favorite. And number two would be The Italian Job, uh, like you mentioned, from 69. That's a really fun one. As you say, if not Get Carter, a great movie to see like early Michael Kane at his best is uh, The Italian Job from the end of the 1960s. And then my number one choice is kind of unusual. We have not mentioned it yet. From 1982, directed by the great Sidney Lumet, based on a play. I've seen it three or four times. I really love this movie. It's called Death Trap. Have you heard of it? I think I have. It's just him and Christopher Reeve and Diane Cannon in a house. And it's totally like a play but it keeps surprising you the way that Sidney Lumet, one of my favorite directors, keeps yeah. building the tension. And there's a, kind of a gay plot to it that comes out of nowhere and really mm-hmm. surprising. And they're doing some interesting things in the early 80s with a film like this that you wouldn't expect. Uh, I think a lot of people hate the Diane Cannon performance. She's very screechy. She runs around the house screaming a lot. Never bothered me that much. <laughs> But uh, if you've only seen Christopher Reeve as Superman, also an interesting film to see him in. It's a different role. It's a film about writers. They're writers. I believe it's been a few years. I believe Christopher Reeve is like an aspiring novelist. He's uh, Michael Caine's this famous novelist. He's published a lot of books. 
And I believe Reeve is like taking his graduate seminar or something. And so they're kind of working together. Reeve is working on a project. And so it's also a film about writers, which is kind of cool too. And uh, yeah, so check out Death Trap from 82. Really, really interesting kind of murder mystery film based on a play uh, directed by Sidney Lumet. One of his, uh, I believe, underappreciated films. All right, yeah. so that takes us to the end here, Harrison. Uh, thanks for so much for being back on Film at 50. We have a few episodes for you to check out that Harrison has been in. How many have you done for me now? Is this the fourth? <laughs> we, had a great, we had a great conversation about I Never Sang for My Father, starring Gene Hackman. We have an episode on Mank, the new David Fincher film, which has just been nominated, Harrison, for 10 Academy Awards. Did you see that? Yeah. It's really, my, 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 my major disappointment in that film really came through. <laughs> no, well, the, the Golden Globes snubbed it. Yeah, so I um, think this is going to be another, you know, another one of these movies that gets the 10 nominations and maybe it actually wins production design. That's about it. <laughs> I think, like I, think I think Don't Sleep on Make. I think it'll surprise you. You think it's going to surprise me? I think, I mean, it got director and picture... It did not get screenplay, which is yeah, which insane. Is, which is <laughs> terrible because it, it was a good screenplay. A good and screenplay. It, it would have been a great nod to David Fincher's dad who yeah. went, passed away in like 03. Like it's been gone for many, many years. It was his only produced screenplay. And, and you know, when there's 10, there's 10 potential nominations where you have adapted and original. For 10, a, t- a movie that got 10 nominations in Mank for them to skip on screenplay. That's really bizarre. Like that made no sense to me. <laughs> but yeah, so if you're interested in our discussion on that, we did that, I believe, last December. And then we have a brand new episode just aired a few weeks ago on THX 1138 and the career of George Lucas. So check that out. Uh, for anyone who, who has not, uh, you know, listened to our previous episodes, Harrison, where can they find you online, find your writing online? Yeah, um, you can... Go to my website, harrisonblackman.com. I also have a new newsletter called The Usonian at harrison.substack.com and <laughs> something like that. Uh, and it's uh, about storytelling and uh, design and architecture. So that, that comes out on a bi-monthly basis. Okay, cool. Well, thanks again, Harrison, for being here today. And thanks to all of you for listening. Uh, check us out online at filmat50.com or on all the socials and at patreon.com slash filmat50. We have two exclusive bonus episodes every month or more. So check that out and support the podcast. Until next time, remember, 50 never looked this good. <laughs>